Welcome to our uh, quarterly meeting and hope you've had a great week so far. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, to Justice Earls um, for introduction of our presenter uh, this morning so we can dive right into the crux of, of our meeting. So Justice Earls. Yes, well, great. Well, uh, thank you, Secretary Buffalo, and um, a huge thank you to everyone for joining us this morning. Um, I, I am excited that we are going to hear from um, Judge Corpening. He has been a friend of the task force. He's, uh, I think, presented to us on a slightly different topic. He's worked with us in a number of different ways, and we are thrilled to have him with us again this morning. Um, so for those of you who um, may not know all of his background, he um, received his bachelor's and JD degrees from Wake Forest University. Um, he was appointed to the bench in 1991 after 12 years in practice. He was named chief district court judge in 2005, and he served in that capacity ever since. So he is currently the longest serving active judge in the history of New Hanover County. He's twice been certified as a juvenile court judge he, he frequently lectures at the UNC School of Government, as well as state, national conferences on topics related to child welfare, juvenile justice, trauma, school justice partnerships, domestic violence, opioids, and other topics. He also chairs and serves on several local and state level committees connected to children and families. He's received many well-deserved awards and recognitions, including being named the National Judge of the Year by the National Court Appointed Special Advocates Guardian Ad Litem Association in 2018. So he, he, he's coming to us, or lives in Wilmington, and Judge Corbin, we are so grateful to you for being with us this morning and looking forward to hearing from you about school justice partnerships and, and how TREK can help further that work. So um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. What a privilege it is to be with all of you today and to see so many friends on screen. Uh, um, you know, it certainly is convenient to meet this way, but I, I miss, um, I miss seeing folks in person. So thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, justice Earls. Um, so, I'm going to spend about 30 minutes talking about school justice partnerships with you this morning. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit, a little bit of background. I know you've heard about school justice partnerships before you've been doing some work in support of it, but. Just to give you some of the reasons why it's so important that we do the work, uh, give you a little bit of a roadmap about where we've been in implementing school justice partnerships, where we're going, and then uh, perhaps uh, some things that that you can do to help us on our journey. So, school justice partnerships uh, started in North Carolina in New Hanover County, uh, and. Um, you know, it's, it was all about how can we keep kids in school and out of court? How can we improve outcomes for our children? Uh, how can we uh, improve graduation rates? How can we make schools safer? How can we address some of the equity issues that we see in schools? Uh, and so um, I met a judge from Clayton County, Georgia, named Steve Teske, who I had been doing the work in Clayton County, Georgia for some period of time. We seemed to have a lot of answers. And so we piled it at New Hanover County. Um, and and it fortunately it got some attention. And so so you know, from there we we began to spread across the state, even in advance of raise the age. So school justice partnerships are about, are about relationships, it's about community coming together to improve outcomes for children. Uh, Cross-system collaboration, uh, some folks use the word collective impact, but how can we work across systems to support our schools, to help our kids, both in our relationships across our community uh, with each other, but also relationships with our students. One of the interesting things that I learned in some work that I did in, in 2013 as chair of a safer schools task force that then David, uh, my district attorney asked me to chair, um, was that school shootings are largely preventable and that there is lots of information in advance of school shootings that, that can be available, but kids don't trust the adults in the building. Uh, we had a, a FBI agent, a retired FBI agent named Larry Bonney that was working with us, who was a behavioralist with the FBI that had investigated 
a number of school shootings uh, in his work with the FBI. Uh, and, and his advice to us is build relationships. Um, make sure that students have trusted adults. And so, so this partnership is about um, improving those relationships. We tend to, in, in our adult world, we tend to work in our silos. Uh, but kids don't live in silos. And so this partnership is an effort to come together to put the pieces of the puzzle of the lives of the children that we're working with uh, together so we're more effective. A little bit of the history of the problem that, that led us to do the work. Um, zero tolerance found its way out of our criminal justice system and into our schools. Uh, and that was amplified after the tragedy at Columbine High School. Um, we saw policy shifts in, in both juvenile justice and in education to be more punitive. And, and, and this is over time. And, you know, I've been a judge now 33, almost 33 years. And so I've seen, you know, lots of, lots of trends and, and this happened starting years ago. Um, but we saw more and more and more students being pushed out of school for minor misconduct. And one of the, one of the challenges is that when students aren't in school, they're not learning. One of the other challenges is when you look at the data as to who is being suspended, who is being referred to court, uh, there also have been some troubling trends. Uh, youth of color and black students in particular overrepresented uh, in school exclusionary school discipline, um, as are our children in foster care, children with educational disabilities, our LGBTQIA kids, uh, students who live in poverty. So our kids who need to be in school the most, who have some of the most serious challenges in their lives are the ones that have been pushed, pushed out through um, through zero tolerance policies. And one of the things we did was actually criminalize adolescent behaviors. Kids have acted up um, for years. I remember in the late 60s and early 70s when I was in high school that everybody knew there was going to be a fight behind the gym. And, and, then, and then those kids landed in the principal's office and parents were called and it was handled. We, never, we didn't see law enforcement at schools. Um, but we, we had a move towards actually criminalizing um, minor misconduct at school. The, the educational research on suspensions is powerful that, you know, there, there are no positive impacts on students when they're suspended from school. There may be a, a safety issue that requires suspension, but if there's not a safety issue, there's not a positive impact. Uh, and I think in our adult world, we sometimes We, we think we're imposing punishment or discipline, but if the kids don't see it as discipline, then, then we're failing in our mission of changing the behavior because we need to be focused on discipline. The root of the word means to teach. We need to be focused on the learning experience of changing behavior while insisting on still having accountability, um, but not just using adult words like suspension and, and pretending that that means something to kids talk to kids who are suspended, they see it as a vacation. So we're, when we overuse suspension, when it's not used for a safety context, which it can be, but if, when it's not used in a safety context, then, then there's not a positive effect. I was on a panel with a researcher from Tulane University a number of years ago, Stephen uh, Philippi, uh, and he had done some research that showed that, that when um, two students of similar status uh, committed some similar misconduct, one referred to court, one managed at school, behavior addressed at school, outcome changed for the poor, for the young person who was referred to court, even in a high functioning juvenile justice system. And that, that got my attention because I'm proud of the work we do in juvenile justice. I'm proud of the changes that we've made, but if we can be more effective in keeping that child in school, then let's be more effective. We've also seen a correlation in exclusionary discipline to gang behavior. Um, and, and, and through COVID, through the isolation of COVID, we saw that same correlation that, that, we, that our gang activity ramped up. Kids were home, 
they were on the street, they were at risk of being recruited um, because lots of our kids aren't at home with supervision. Uh, they're, they're at home without supervision, which means they're probably not staying at home. And then, and yes, all this does contribute to the school to prison pipeline, which is real because I've lived and worked at the end of the pipeline for my whole career. School connectedness is so important, and these are just some studies that show that, but I think that the best evidence of the strong protective factor that school is, is what happened with our experience with COVID and the isolation that our kids experienced. Um, kids lost the protective factor of school, risk factors in their lives ramped up, and we came back out of COVID with um, Kids carrying guns like never before in my career, kids shooting other kids like never before in my career, behavior at school out of control like never before. Um, and it was about losing the protective factor of school. So, so finding a way to keep kids in school is so incredibly important. So some of this is about brain science, but also about trauma uh, connected to brain science. You know, we, in our, in our court system, we use science all the time. And in some of the work that, that you do in your daily walk, uh, you use science all the time. And it's important for us to pay attention to, to brain science as we're thinking about how we respond to kids. Um, we know that impulsivity declines with age. Um, it's it's not just random fact that your insurance rates as a driver fall off when you're 26 years old. It's brain science. It's about risk. Um, it's it's not a random fact that you can't rent a car in America until I think it's age 25, maybe 26, but I think it's 25. It's brain science. It's about risk because impulsivity declines with age as that frontal frontal lobe develops. Preference for risk, interestingly enough, peaks around age 16 and 17. That's that, that frontal lobe, um, that, that impulsivity being drawn to risk taking behavior. Um, and so we've been responding historically to that preference for risk, to that impulsivity by sending kids to court and punishing them because of the way their brain is functioning. Um, when we have other opportunities to respond differently. And then let's layer on top of, of, of this part of brain science, let's layer on trauma. We know more now about the effect of trauma on the brain than ever before. And I'm so grateful to have been able to work with Chief Justice Newby and the work that uh, his ACES task force um, uh, ACES Informed Courts Task Force has done. Um, we know so much now about how trauma affects the brain, changes the brain and the body, uh, life-altering changes as a result of childhood trauma. Um, and we know that that trauma lands in our classrooms uh, and that learning can't happen until the trauma has been addressed. And so finding a way to build protection around those kids who have experienced trauma, to build supports within the school for kids who have experienced profound childhood trauma. And I'm not, I'm not talking about just one incident. I'm talking about kids who are exposed to, to toxic stress, kids who are exposed to trauma all the time, kids who are hiding under their beds from gunfire every night, kids who have domestic violence in their home, kids who are exposed to you, you name it, the, the risk factors are out there for them. Um, we have to take into account that brain science too and find ways to respond more effectively. And one of the best ways that I know of is to keep them in school and build protection around them, build build that support for them, build that, that stable and caring adult in their life who can minimize their trauma. So part of the reason that 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 this became uh, so important for North Carolina is particularly as we were looking at raise, raise the age in North Carolina, which uh, passed in 2017, uh, effective in uh, December 1, 2019, is that over time, just over 
percent of our juvenile justice cases come out of schools. Um, which is which is pretty significant, especially when you look at what are the what are the offenses that are that are coming to us. Um, most of the top few uh, referral cases, type of referral cases that come to us are minor misconduct, simple affray, nobody gets hurt, a simple assault where nobody gets hurt. An example, classic example that, that my district attorney and I talk about, <laughs> two boys who get in a fight over a girl and still want to have lunch together the same day. But the reaction 20 years ago was those boys were suspended for 10 days and they were referred to court. And of course, at that time, if they were 16, they went to adult court. And then they had an adult charge. And then if they were convicted, they had an adult conviction. Um, so, um, you know, disorderly conduct, um, misdemeanor larceny, minor drug or alcohol offenses. I'm talking marijuana. I'm not talking about, you know, the more dangerous uh, drugs that might uh, come to school. But um, were automatic referrals to court. So part of what we worked to do was to develop a graduated response model so that we uh, we didn't bring a hammer every time we came to a conversation. Um, as parents, we use a graduated response model. We don't call it that, but as parents and disciplining our children, we don't respond with the harshest punishment that we have in our toolkit for every single thing that our children do. We try to respond appropriately to the behavior. We hope that our children learn from that discipline. If they continue the misbehavior, then we respond with some other enhanced discipline, uh, still trying to help them learn, trying to help them change. And we and we hope that we're successful. And then if we're not, then then we move to another step. But we don't start at the most serious punishment we've got at hello. Uh, we've never done that as parents. We did that in schools for years, and this school justice partnership work is all about changing that. We've seen some really powerful outcomes from doing this work uh, in in New Hanover, where I'm most familiar. But I've done I've done some work with other counties. Uh, did a lot of really close work with Lenore, Wayne, and Green counties with some other counties. We've seen a real mindset shift in our school buildings. Uh, with, you know, for example, a middle school principal that I've known for years going from one of the leading, I'll call him one of the leading suspenders in, in our county school system to having a conversation with me several years ago that he said, Judge Corporating, if, if I can solve the problem with these young people at school, then why would I send them home? Exactly. That's exactly the point. Um, We've seen improved outcomes for students, and I'll, I'll, I've got a graph that I'll share with you in a minute about, about some of that in terms of graduation. We've reduced collateral consequences. Some of our students at school are 18 and get referred to adult court if they are sent to court, right? So we still have issues with collateral consequences because of arrest and potential conviction on their record. Uh, we've seen an interruption in the school to prison pipeline. Pre-COVID in particular, we have we've saw a real change in a more positive school climate. Law enforcement was building relationships. Our school resource officers in the schools were building relationships with students instead of running them downtown. Um, behavior was better. There were less disciplined referrals in our schools. Um, COVID changed a lot of that because of some of the reasons I've talked about, and we're hoping that the protective factor of schools will build us back into that um, more positive climate coming up. We've seen increased graduation rates. Our schools are safer uh, as a result of doing the work. And yes, these partnerships do support Raise the Age in North Carolina. Here's a graph that should take your breath away. Um, so uh, the orange bar is the percentage of students who are referred to court by SROs when when the, when the when the SROs got referrals. So the year before we implemented our school justice partnership, 83% of students who were referred to SROs went to court. The next year, it was 30%. Just by being intentional 
in how we respond to student misconduct by recognizing that minor misconduct can be dealt with in ways other than referral to court. You can see that our dropout rates went down, our graduation rates went up. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't want this? Who wouldn't want this kind of outcome for students? And through two superintendents in New Hanover, uh, I've listened to the superintendent in Lenore County, um, while there are lots of good things going on in our schools that can enhance improved graduation rates, all of those superintendents have given credit to school justice partnerships and having a positive impact on graduation rates. To quote my friend Steve Teske, who'd have thought that if you keep kids in school, graduation rates would increase? So these are examples of some of the, the minor charges that I was that I was speaking about. So the, the goal we have is to is for, for districts to be able to develop an MOU, uh, develop an agreement. Um, you know, it's not a contract, it's an MOU. Uh, we had some misunderstandings about that early on. That sets clear guidelines for our uh, for our schools about the roles of law enforcement in the schools and the roles of the schools. Uh, we have found that all of our partners have really appreciated that clarification because now law enforcement knows that they're not supposed to be called to a class because a student won't turn off their phone. That's a discipline issue. Um, uh, we had a great training that was developed by one of our behavioral specialists in New Hanover County that was called Why Call 911? Uh, and she identified um, teachers who were. Um, making a lot of uh, referrals to law enforcement out of their classrooms. And she would lead off the training with, why did you call 911? And the teachers all responded, we didn't call 911. And then my friend Judy would respond, well, you call the law, that's, that's calling 911. Um, can we, and then she would try to reset and say, can we refocus and call administrators? for minor behavior when there's not a safety issue. Can we call an administrator? And that had a profound impact because then administrators were empowered to deal with the issues right away without involving law enforcement. Um, and law enforcement was there building relationships and responding to more urgent and emergent needs. Um, the, uh, the MOUs that have been developed uh, so far across North Carolina have not limited the discretion of either schools or law enforcement. I think that's an important point. And we spent a lot of time talking with our Sheriff's Association and our Police Chiefs Association about that. Um, it actually increases dis discretion of law enforcement, increases discretion of schools, because for, for my law enforcement partners, for the, for the first time in decades, they have felt they weren't compelled to send a kid to court. They actually felt empowered to work with the kid and keep the child in school and work with them and meet their needs at school instead of having to send them to court. And, and our educators felt the same way. Um, and one of the beautiful things about, about our MOU, and, and there have been several videos that were filmed out of New Hanover um, about our signing ceremonies. Uh, the last time we had a signing ceremony, um, Chief Justice Beasley was Chief Justice at that time, and she came and spoke. Every member of our county commission was on that stage. Every member of our city council and our mayor was on the stage. Every member of our board of education and the superintendent were on the stage. Our director of public health, our director of DSS, our district attorney, you, you get the picture. Our whole community has come together in support of this work. So. When we had a tragedy at school two years ago, when we had some community violence that spilled into New Hanover High School and we had a shooting that happened at school, we already had relationships and we immediately came came together across the table and and put our heads together and with the help of some um, ideas that spun out of the Governor's Crime Commission, we were able to build a very effective response that we're um, that we're in year two of now uh, in trying to respond to community violence. But our school justice partnership working across systems helped build those, the foundation of those relationships so when we were in crisis, 
we knew who we needed at the table and we were able to come together. We did uh, at AOC, uh, uh, the administrative office of the courts built a toolkit. The toolkit uh, is, a, is really an aid for chief district court judges as they are serving as conveners in their communities um, to uh, know how to call a meeting, has sample agendas, has a, zap, a sample MOU, has educational research. We've upgraded the toolkit once uh, during the time that it's been in existence. And it was developed as a tool for, for the chiefs who were conveners because the statutory mandate uh, from the General Assembly is to the director of the administrative office of the courts to develop policies and procedures for chief district court judges to convene stakeholders and develop school justice partnerships. Um, uh, we're proud of the toolkit. Uh, Judge Teske shared with me during a joint presentation that he and I did a couple of years ago that the toolkit that we've developed is the best product in the country to help communities work with uh, developing school justice partnerships. So where have we been? I just shared with you what the statutory mandate to the director is. That I think the number uh, is 57 partnerships to date. Um, I never dreamed when we started our work in New Hanover that we would actually be going statewide. So there are days that I, that I pinch myself, um, say, gosh, is this real? Are we really helping this many children? Um, we've got seven groups that are in various stages of, of doing the work. Uh, and we have built what I would call broad based support uh, for this work. Um, the, we spent a lot of time with the Sheriff's Association and the Chiefs Association building support with those two organizations. Uh, with the Conference of District Attorneys, the Chief Justice Aces and Forms Task Force has endorsed the statewide expansion and 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 has directed AOC to continue to do the work that that uh, has been going on to uh, continue the spread of ACES informed courts. The governor's crime commission remains committed to uh, uh, grant funding in support of school justice partnerships. And of course, y'all have taken a recommend. Y'all have taken you, you you've made recommendations about the expansion of school justice partnerships. Um, you know. There's a there's a great video and I'm going to give you our our website uh, at AOC so that you can look at some of the resources that are online and there's a nine minute video that I would encourage you to watch. I've been doing this a long time. When I when I went on the bench, we rode horses to work. Uh, it's been that long. <laughs> some days it feels like it has been. This is the most important work that I've ever done. When you think about the number of children that can be impacted across North Carolina by doing this work, the number of children whose lives we can impact, the positive change we can bring to our schools, why wouldn't you want to do the work? This is, this is incre an incredible opportunity for all of our counties, for all of our local education authorities to dive in and do the work. So we've still got work to do. There are a total of 112 local education authorities in North Carolina. You know, some some counties have a county school system, a city school system. Um, you know, so it works out 112. But you know, so we're just over oh, just over halfway there. We got work to do. But the the good news is we're over halfway there. Uh, and that's my glass half full testimony to you today is that we're over halfway there. And, uh, and I think that's exciting. Um, the North Carolina administrative office of the courts is all in on this and is totally committed. Uh, they have, uh, tasked folks with, uh, supporting, uh, communities who want to do this work, including working with them to build their teams, to come and do presentations for communities, to, um, provide resources. Um, the, the website that's, um, that's listed here, uh, has resources, has our toolkit, has, um, the video that I mentioned, um, has a fact sheet. Also, have, we've got an email, a dedicated email address that, that one of our team will respond to, uh, if anyone has questions, 
uh, about school justice partnerships or needs to make a contact about school bus justice partnerships. So, so we're encouraged to keep doing the work. So, you know, I've been in some, um, you know, ongoing conversations about, about, about you guys, your team, what can you do? And judge Regina Parker was kind enough to invite me to participate in some conversations with her and a few others, uh, some folks from AOC. Um, and being mindful that the, that the statutory directive was to the director of the administrative office of the courts to implement this process. What can, what can you do? You are, you are all people of influence. Um, and in, in, in many different ways, uh, you come from different walks of life. You have different spheres of influence, but you're people of influence. People in your community know you. You can help school justice partnerships by using that influence to start conversations in your community. We've got some communities where the conversations haven't started for a variety of reasons, <coughs> but you can be a person of influence to start those conversations with, with the chief district court judge in your community, with your juvenile crime prevention council. There are several areas where juvenile crime prevention councils have, have been the backbone organization to bring folks together. Um, with your local advocacy groups uh, in Rowan County, local advocacy groups came together to, 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 to really build up the work and work with the court system. Uh, and then you can also connect with uh, administrative office of the court uh, resources uh, to try to connect the dots in your community. But I think that as our, as my conversations with Judge Parker evolved, it became clear that, that your, your endorsement of the work certainly is important, but individually you can have incredible impact across our state. You come from all over the state and you can have incredible influence across our state in spreading this work and in stimulating the conversation in your community. Because once people look at the data, once people look at the outcomes, once, once they hear about the profound positive changes for kids, it's, sometimes it's like a light bulb comes on. So um, I was offered the opportunity for 30 minutes of conversation with you and then 10 minutes of question. I've just finished 30 minutes of conversation with you. Um, I'm happy to answer questions for the next 10 or so minutes. I've got some more availability after that, but I'll be at uh, the chair's uh, pleasure for that. Well, thank you so much. I, um, I it's really impressive what you've been doing and especially helpful to hear your thoughts on, on how task force members can can um, possibly get involved locally. I have some questions, but I, um, I also er, er, encourage, so I see that there's a hand up. Um, and so uh, that, um, let me call on um, our commission member first, Deborah Dix Maxwell. Let me take my hand down, I always forget. Hello, Judge Batman J. Um, I'm in the same community with him. And so as we go forward and the program has worked here, please ask the task force members to look at the age of school discipline and school discipline policies. While we had that program here, children K through three, which is the earliest start of the pipeline, or receiving suspensions. So I ask people to look at that before they, as they venture into their communities. Totally supportive though. Thank you, Judge J. Batman. Great to see you, Deborah. And um, Callie, go ahead. Morning, Judge Corpening. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, and um, I, I think so highly of your work. Uh, and um, one of the things that um, you mentioned um, a lot was the trauma and getting to sort of um, really sort of helping to support kids in the root causes of what's what's really going on. And we have sort of an unprecedented opportunity with um, behavioral health funds um, that have been appropriated by the General Assembly. And I'm just wondering how um, those 
the the lessons learned and the and the work that y'all are doing with the school justice partnerships across the state, um, and you know just some of the challenges that we've had with the school attorneys and getting schools to really sort of embrace this, how we can really um, make this successful and overcome any barriers. And then we also have just a data recommendation that I've been asking a lot about sort of where that's at. Um, and I put it in the chat for the panelists, but it's um, for anybody who wants to look at it, it's um, recommendation 23 of our our report and it's really about getting um, making sure we have all of the school suspension data and all of the juvenile court uh, referral data and trying to make sure that we have a real um, understanding by school by county of um, the impact of disability and race or by suspensions and referrals uh, by race uh, gender disability status which of course is important to me um, and so I would love for us to be able to work with you, Judge Corpening, on on making sure that that recommendation really gets fulfilled. But going back to my question, I just would love to know sort of what y'all thoughts are about the behavioral health funding. Sure. Let me let me start with the last point, Tally. First, and it's great to see you too. Um, you know, uh, juvenile justice does a great job of keeping their data, and the and the schools are required to keep their suspension data as well, and they're required to support to report their suspension data. There's not a single source for that, but the data exists out there. You know, COVID, COVID years have sort of skewed our data because of the behavioral issues surrounding the trauma issue of isolation and the loss of, of, of the, the support of school for so long. Um, I'm hoping that we'll get to some more normal data coming up, but I think it's, I agree that it's important to be data driven. One of my hopes on your, your first question, Tally, is that we that there will be a nexus between the funding that's available and actually meeting the needs of our kids who are in school. Um, some of that is about um, adequately assessing their needs. Uh, you know, for example, uh, Ben David and I have been advocating that we use um, the ten Aces question just as a, a screener uh, for indicators of where we ought to be looking and what what needs might be there. Uh, and there has been some resistance. One of the things that we hear back is, well, if we identify the need, then we're going to have to meet it. Well, well, yes, that's exactly right. Yes. Um, yes, that's why we, and that's why in juvenile justice, we screen. And that's why with, with the Yazi uh, screening instrument that juvenile justice uses now, um, they've incorporated ACEs uh, science into, into that screener. So we're we're looking for trauma because when we see that there's childhood trauma, we need to be more careful than ever in making sure we're meeting the needs of that child um, because of the long-term impacts that that trauma can have. So I'm hoping, Tally, that with the expanded funding that, that there can be a nexus to our kids in school who need so much. Um, you know, I, I'm happy to be a part of any conversations about that. Uh, success of our children is near and dear to my heart. Success of all of our children is near and dear to my heart uh, because all of our children ought to have the right and the opportunity to be successful. And we ought to be putting all of our tools that are available to us in place to meet their needs. Uh, you know, school based expansion of school based mental health, for example. Um, you know, we're blessed, and, and Deborah can can affirm this, we're blessed in New Hanover. New Hanover made a commitment a number of years ago to, to put school-based mental health in place across our system. Uh, and, and, and that was a response to the Safer Schools Task Force that I chaired, because one of, the, one of our main recommendations was, you gotta take care of what's within the walls of the schools if the schools are ever gonna be safe. And so this is, this is a really an important piece here. And, Using that funding to address the behavioral health needs of those of the kids we see in school who need it so much. Thanks, and I'll just say very quickly that our executive committee for this task force um, had uh, a, a really good presentation. Um, I wish we had a, a 12 hours for the presentation because there's so many different things, but. Um, the Division of Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities is tasked with getting this funding out the door and. Um, they have an incredible director in Kelly Crosby. She's come and spoke to us twice, um, but I think, um, you know, it would be really good that it's not just our executive committee, but this whole task force 
get um, an update on the behavioral health funding since it's almost a billion dollars of funding um, for us to really sort of see how and how we can really support this funding to be successful over this year um, because it's going to come out in two tranches. Um, it's all going to come out in the next 12 months and this is our moment. So we've got to do our best to take advantage of it and support the department um, in doing it well because it's an it's a wonderful but monumental task. Um, so I see that uh, Representative Lori has her hand up, but I just want to follow up on that last point, which is, um, so I guess I'm asking Kelly, are you suggesting, and, um, and I apologize if I missed this, but that that funding from that source could help fund the work of school justice partnerships in places where they don't exist? Because I, I, I wasn't, it sounded from the presentation that that the school justice partnership is really about collaboration and I didn't hear, you know, that you, you have to have funding to make it work. But if I miss that, I want to know. <laughs> no, well, I'll let Judge Grippening mostly answer, but I, I, my, mm, I, I think there's a huge linkage between making sure that there is school based behavioral health and the success of school justice partnerships. And this is our opportunity to get that school based behavioral health and other crisis response services, alternative crisis response services, children's mental health. I mean, there's just the funding is sort of now for those things that can grease the wheels for school justice partnerships. But I don't know if Judge Corpening has a different answer. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that, that we didn't have any funding to implement New Hanover. Uh, Lenore, Wayne and Green didn't have any funding. Other counties didn't have any funding. What developed over time, particularly as Raise the Age passed and began to be implemented, Governor's Crime Commission made school justice partnerships a priority in fund priority area for funding. And so there are a number of projects that have been funded for, you know, a person to be a coordinator. But 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 the 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 funding that Tally is talking about is actually, you know, behavioral health services in our schools to meet the kids, meet the needs of the kids in the school so that as schools identify the need, then there's there's a response that's at school without having to send the kid out of school. Um, so it sounds like that's useful both where there are existing partnerships as well as helping to spur new ones. If I'm Absolutely. Right. But so thank you for that. But um, uh, let me turn to Representative Moore. Thank you, and and what a great presentation. Really appreciate it, Judge. Uh, we work together for many, many years. I think part of this funding thing, every county has a juvenile crime prevention council, a JCPC. And so a lot of what we're talking with the partnership, they can draw upon their own local JCPC to draw funds up for these school interventions that are needed and the behavioral health. Maybe some of these behavioral health dollars could be applied for through increased funding from the legislature for the juvenile crime prevention councils. I think they've proven to be exceptional in, in helping the individual counties priorities and their needs. And I think it's a, a perfect uh, collaboration with these partnerships. But Jay, you've done a tremendous job. It's really helped. We need it in every county. And uh, I, I think the train's on the track and going to full participation, but thank you so much. And Deborah's point about the K through three, you know, we did recommend that we take the youngest kids out of our juvenile court system. And with TREC and our recommendation and legislation, we got the six, seven, eight year olds out of our courtrooms for appropriate uh, help for them. So thank you. And I'll just, as a quick note, Marsha, it's great to see you. Um, we, um, you know, we're not seeing any eight and nine year olds either. Um, so, you know, even though there were some exceptions for eight and nine to be able to refer to court, we're not, we're not seeing them, which is wonderful. Um, it looks like we still have four minutes. So does anyone else have questions? Uh, Deborah Dix Maxwell, go ahead. It's not a question. It's just a comment that, as just to reemphasize what Judge Jay said, it is truly a collaborative effort in this community. 
And I was trying to get an answer, Judge Jay, from Jeff Vinay, because we have a resiliency task force here that addresses issues through the ACES. I'm sorry I was late. And that would be helpful for those who are going to look for it. There are, not, there are others around the state. And that's a good supportive vehicle of a, no, how many, 50 organizations, I think, Judge Jay, or something like that, that are working with children and families that are part of this that help support what we're doing also, what he's doing. What we're Thank doing. Thank you. Uh, Sheriff Burkhead. Good morning, and thank you, Judge Corpening, for the presentation, excellent presentation. Uh, I agree with everything that you uh, have presented to us this morning. I was sitting here trying my best to be quiet, uh, and everyone on this call knows that sometimes I just can't do that. Um, I, we have a school justice partnership here in Durham. It's kind of hit a lull, and we're trying to resurrect it and bring it back for a number of reasons, change our leadership things like that. Uh, but one of the things I continue to hear, and I agree with Tally so uh, so much about the behavioral health and getting those resources into our schools. Uh, my SRO program, we've been doing this since I was sheriff, 2018, since I became sheriff. Uh, and we build those relationships. But the conversation now is how do we remove the SROs from the equation uh, to fund uh, those clinicians to 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 uh, engage in the behavioral health. I think that's the wrong conversation, of course. And then the other part is when we talk about trauma, oftentimes, uh, you're right, we don't get to the root cause of the trauma using the questionnaire. And I'm not in that space, but I don't see that happening on a regular uh, and I have these conversations with my colleagues in the Sheriff's Association as well. Uh, and, and my final thought is we can't find enough clinicians to do this work. And, and I'm concerned about that. And uh, so we may end up looking at an alternative model of folks who are not quite qualified to do this type of work. Uh, but until then, I'm going to keep my SROs in the schools. We're going to continue to engage with our kids, build these relationships, because we have seen some extraordinary results uh, in Durham with that. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Very helpful. Does um, anyone else have a question or a comment? I, I, I will um, quickly ask my question, which was, um, about data, back to data, uh, it was very powerful. You, you, you started out by sort of identifying some of the, um, if you will, subgroups of students that are overrepresented um, in referrals to courts. Uh, and what I was wondering is whether the data that you have along the sort of accountability measures, you know, you were reporting um, numbers of referrals and uh, suspensions, whether there's any breakdown of that data by any of those categories. So whether that's race, so like what the race of the students um, or disability or income or in foster care, like if there's any any way to be a little more granular about the um, results. So my hope is that in the future we'll be able to be every bit as granular as, as, as your question uh, suggests. Because we need we need to be more granular and look at our data. We are we are able to identify race and age um, in our juvenile justice referral, um, but are not able to necessarily get any more granular than that. Um, but okay. but I'm hoping that we can. Um, we're um, some of that depends on what data dashboard you have available to you. Um, but um, but I'm I'm a fan of of getting it. You know, I'd love to know, you know, exactly how many of our kids with educational disabilities are suspended. For example, for example, you know, in Tally's wheelhouse, um, you know, we we know how many black and brown children are being suspended um, because we get that information. But how many kids in foster care are being suspended or referred to court? Our kids, our kids whose 
whose very future depends on their educational stability because for kids aging out in foster care, that education is the single most important stability factor in their life. Um, so I'm, Justice Searles, I'm hoping that we can get, get more granular in our data. Thank you. I see two more hands, uh, Judge Parker. Just very quickly, uh, Judge Corpany, thank you so much for coming today and then your presentation. Um, as you know, I have school justice partnerships in my five counties, and we are a resource poor area. Um, we, I am seeing a lot of behavioral health issues in my counties. And just want to just ask you a question, understanding we do have the, the billion or so dollars that will be available in maybe 12 months or so. Um, what do you suggest um, as a course of action, trying to help um, my schools, the county, provide behavioral health services for our children in need? Um, and, and again, we have so many children who need services and we have a few, but again, we don't have even as um, Sheriff said, the clinicians, the folks available. And I don't know if you have any thoughts, suggestions, and I'll stop talking and, and hear your thoughts on that. So a lot can a lot can happen when you're talking billion with a B, right? Um and you know it's a terrific opportunity to build what we've been talking about for years because you know the school based mental health initiative has been meeting for years uh trying to find ways to expand school based mental health services um and and it's been challenging because of funding right but you know from you know and and, and my jcpcs and both my urban and my rural counties have made funding behavioral health a priority in their funding uh, we've done it for over 20 years in New Hanover and I think about 10 years in Pender. So my juvenile justice kids in both counties don't call 1-800-TRILLION. We've got a county-based referral service for psychological services that can do every kind of evaluation that we need, and it's at no cost to the family. And we have a clinician in court every court day ready to meet with the family, explain the process to them, and then if they elect to you know, go with that free service, then it's available to them and there's no delay. We need the same kind of service in our schools where our kids who have, because all of our kids with behavioral issues land in school, right? Right, they're all in school. What better place to try to meet those needs? And I think that Regina, as, as we, you know, as the folks who are in charge of spending that billion dollars look at it, there there i see some opportunities for our rural partners with recruitment and compensation one of the challenges is you know if you try to get somebody to come and open a private practice in one of your counties that may not be sustainable but if there's funding to hire them as a school employee at a meaningful wage in your rural county then that's a different type of question right so so I think I think there's some real opportunities here. Well, you know I'm passionate, and I'll be advocating um, for my for my district and my county. So thank you so much for answering my question. My pleasure. Uh, it's Caroline. Oh, we can't hear you. Okay. Right. Thanks, Justice Earls. Hi, Judge Corpening. I know I'm not a task force member. Um, but real quick, I, we've, you've acknowledged, and I, we certainly are all aware of, uh, and the rise in juvenile crime post pandemic. Has any research been done in the, in comparing the numbers in the areas of states that have. SJPs versus the ones that don't have school justice partnerships. Have, I mean, have, have those partnerships and communication that you've built been more in, impactful in, in the rate of juvenile crime. So, so let me share an anecdote with you. 10 years ago, I dropped out of rotary because my Tuesdays, my delinquent day were so crazy that I couldn't, I couldn't make my rotary lunch meetings. I'm back in rotary now. Even post pandemic with the bumps we've seen, my dockets are 
low enough that I can make rotary on time. And that's in my busiest county, right? That's in my urban county, New Hanover. Now, you know, our numbers aren't like, you know, Wake and Mecklenburg, um, but but still, you know, we've we've seen an uptick, but but our, our school justice partnership built a foundation of reduced numbers because we're dealing with so many things as you know, teenage behavior instead of criminal conduct, um, that that my dockets had fallen off dramatically. Um, it created opportunities for my chief court counselor to repurpose a position or two to have an intensive, you know, court counselor to have somebody doing more training. Um, you know, so all kinds of opportunities are created when we reduce cases. We can be much more. In, intentional and interventional with our kids that we're serving that do come to us. All right. Well, I um, I'm so grateful to you for your time. You've been very generous, and this has been incredibly helpful. A very rich discussion. I hope you will feel free to call on any of the task force members if there's any way we can help you individually, as well as if there's a way as a task force we can. Um, make a difference. So um, I think we'll, uh, I, I know we're all grateful to you for being with us this morning and, and most importantly for the incredible work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure being with you today. Hope everyone has a great day, great weekend. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Justice Earls. Uh, now we'll, we'll turn to our committee updates who have been meeting and, and facilitating some great work uh, to uh, look at our uh, implementation of our TREC recommendations. So I'll start with the executive committee. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Secretary Buffalo. Um, Lieutenant Garten is actually at another meeting, so I'm gonna stand in and give um, the update for the executive committee. So the executive committee met um, earlier this month in February, and it was our deep dive into DHHS. And Tally touched on this a little bit, um, but we got two different presentations. And the first one, as he mentioned, was around funding opportunities for behavioral health. And as Tally mentioned, there's a lot of money up for grabs, um, which is exciting to hear. And some of the topics that they covered, and, and it was Kelly Crosby, again, the director, was that there's funding around um, deflection and diversion programs, as well as reentry programs. And so I think that um, it sounds like there's interest at the executive committee level to sort of explore partnerships, um, ways that the committee can get that word out to make sure folks know um, that these funding opportunities are there and sort of what would meet that criteria to get selected. And we also heard an update from DHHS on Medicaid expansion. Um, it was sort of a holistic look at Medicaid expansion, but there was some focus around Medicaid for the justice involved reentry initiative. Um, and so again, with this one, the committee is gonna be looking at ways to get word out on these opportunities. Medicaid expansion is here. And so making sure um, those justice involved folks know that, that those opportunities are there. I suspect there will be um, some partnership with the Department of Adult Correction. Um, I know they're already working on this, but any ways that the committee and track as a whole can support that um, is, is sort of on the on the topic list for the upcoming year. Um, and so we've had one meeting so far, but we're looking forward to um, the rest of 2024 and happy to answer any questions if needed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, any questions for the executive committee? All right, I'll turn it over to the legislative committee. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, Secretary Buffalo, thank you for uh, the time. Um, we don't have much going on with the legislative committee right now. We're just essentially planning uh, to get our stakeholders together with the AOC Conference of DAs, Sheriff's Associations, and some other folks. Uh, to get together about driver's license restoration, as many of you might know, April 24th is when uh, the short session is going to kick off at the General Assembly. So we're trying to meet with some of these stakeholders uh, prior to that, hopefully sometime in early March, uh, and we'll keep you posted on more information. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll now go to local policy. 
Uh, thank you, Secretary Buffalo. Um, we have not met this month yet. We're going to meet next week. Uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to mention, though, briefly that's happened since we had our meeting in Raleigh. The first thing, uh, immediately after the meeting in Raleigh, we had a law enforcement advisory group meeting that, that many members of, of this call were on. We had uh, chiefs and sheriffs and officers from from all over the state, and we appreciated them taking the time to come down to Raleigh. We talked for a couple of hours. We covered, uh, I wrote it down, items like uh, you know, training and accreditation, the whole question of community involvement. Uh, talked a lot about the peaceful demonstration uh, recommendation, mental health issues across the board. Uh, so it was a it was a very useful and engaging conversation, and our law enforcement subgroup is using going to be using that information to help inform what we're going to be doing over the rest of the year. The second thing I'd mention is something that we've been made aware of that we didn't know until this month, and that is that there is an initiative in the western part of the state being uh, spearheaded by a couple of professors at Western Carolina University, and it, it revolves around uh, really uh, almost completely around our first recommendation, our, our recommendation number one, which is reimagining public safety, responding more appropriately to situations concerning mental illness, autism, intellectual disability, substance abuse, homelessness, or other non-emergency situations. And what it is, is they are, those professors are using resources in the uh, uh, Department of Criminal Justice that they have up there, as well as Department of Social Work, to bring uh, assistance to small communities, rural communities in Western North Carolina, to try and look at alternative uh, 911 responses in, in dealing more appropriately f with some of these uh, non-emergency or other types of issues that might be more appropriately dealt with through the social service systems or other systems. It's really interesting and it's really exciting. And they are going, those two professors are going to be uh, making a presentation to our local committee meeting next week, next Wednesday morning at eight o'clock. And if anyone, any of y'all, any member of the task force wants to sit in and, and watch that presentation, uh, just shoot me an email or shoot Brandy an email and we'll get you an invite. So those are the two things going on right now with us. And I'll give it back to you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the local policy? All right, uh, we'll wrap up committee re reports with judicial. Thank you, Secretary Buffalo. Um, I'm happy to, to give the judicial committee report today. Uh, I think our, our big news is that we will be screening a film followed by a panel discussion on Wednesday, March 6th, that we'd love for all of you to attend and to spread the word about. The film is called Judging Juries. Um, it's 23 minutes long. I'm going to put a link in the chat to um, somewhere where you can see the trailer and read more about it. Um, it primarily focuses on the issue of um, barriers to jury service um, that interfere with the um, seating of a, of a cross-section of the community and particularly the issue around low juror pay. Um, so it, it profiles what uh, transpired in San Francisco when they um, initiated a pilot project called Be the Jury. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat um, to more information about that project uh, where they uh, through county funds or city funds, local, local funds, um, they made available a, um, a, a significant increase in juror pay for low and moderate income um, community members who otherwise would not be able to serve as jurors. So instead of receiving $15 a day, they received $100 a day. Um, and this is a documentary about that project, about the reasons why they, they launched it, about their efforts to take it statewide, and just about a lot of intersecting issues um, that Trek's recommendations on jury inclusivity um, are really focused on as well. So um, our hope for that um, film screening, which will be a virtual, free, open to the public screening on Wednesday, March 6th at noon. So you can just kind of circle your, your lunch hour that day and join us. 
is that we'll all be able to enjoy the film and then a half an hour panel discussion um, that I will moderate about how these issues uh, show up in North Carolina. And that um, uh, the panelists for that will be um, task force member, District Attorney Jeff Neiman, who's on the Judicial Committee, um, Judge Vince Rozier from Wake County, Wake County Superior Court, um, Chief Public Defender from New Hanover County, Jennifer Harjo. So we'll have a, a you know a defense prosecutor and, and, and judicial perspective on these issues. And we hope that you all can join us. I believe Brandy's going to send out the information about how to register immediately after today's um, quarterly meeting. Um, but we have a lot going on. We had a great uh, Judicial Committee meeting um, in February and have a lot that we're hoping to do this year, including um, an effort that is spearheaded by, by our co-chair, uh, Judge Thornburg, to um, host a re-entry simulation out in the western part of the state. We'd also like to do that in the eastern part of the state. Obviously, um, Judge Parker um, really took the lead in bringing Judge Corpening here today and um, continuing to foreground the issue of school justice partnerships. Um, and I also just wanted to thank everybody from Trek who was a part of the Justice Unbound Symposium that we put on on Saturday. Um, Henderson Hill and Justice Earls were part of the planning committee for that. It took place at Duke Law um, this Saturday. And I think it was, a, it was a great success. It was really great to hear from Judge Parker about all the work that she's doing in the eastern part of the state on re-entry and school justice partnerships and mental health. Um, Judge Thornburg, I know you were in attendance and it was great to have you there. We had 43 judges. Um, and um, I know it's been a real goal of this task force and of the Judicial Committee in particular to make sure that we're filling the gap in education for judges around race equity and addressing bias and inequality. So I think this was a um, hopefully a really um, a good start to, to trying to kind of reinvigorate that work in the state. And I'm really grateful for all of the people um, that are part of this body who, who contributed um, so significantly to, to the success of that program. Um, we have a lot of other thoughts for the year, but we're still kind of in planning mode. Um, and our, our most immediate um, ask of you is just that you join us on March 6th um, and spread the word about that screening. And I'm happy to take any questions if y'all have questions. Uh, seeing one question. Uh, it's actually, um, I just wanted to add one thing to Kara's report, if that's all right. Sure. Um, I just wanted to, um, to, to highlight for um, folks um, the, the Medicaid um, request that the state is making uh, for justice involved re entry. Um, and specifically, uh, there's a slide um, in the slide deck that they shared with us, slide 20, that um, I'm sure we could send out um, that talks about the specific request to provide a set of targeted pre release Medicaid services in the 90 day period prior to release for all Medicaid eligible adults and youth. And um, they're looking for um, to cover pre release services in all 53 state prisons and youth correctional facilities. Um, and um, that would include care management, medication assisted treatment, and um, 30 days of medication. And that just seems like a huge deal. So I just wanted to make sure folks are aware of that. And they're, so they're applying for it. They've got to get approval from CMS, but I think their hope was July of 2024. Thank, thank you, Tally, for uh, that addition. Uh, great comment. I'll turn it over to you, Justice Earl, for any uh, new business. Yeah, thank you. And I certainly welcome any anyone else to raise anything new, but somewhat following up on the Judicial Committee report and the Justice Unbound Symposium, um, that was there were a number of co-sponsors, and one of the co-sponsors um, was the um, the National Commission National Consortium on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Court. And so I kind of want to propose for Trek that we consider becoming a member organization of the National Consortium. Now, um, and so we can send around um, the the website and more information about what that means. The any individual can join, but the concept behind the National Consortium was when four states 
um, in 1988, began working on issues of racial bias in court systems um, and came together that their task forces wanted to, to support each other's work. And, and I found it incredibly encouraging that their sponsorship in this conference meant, you know, we had a judge from North Dakota, who's the chair of the consortium who came and spoke, um, as, as well as judges from Maryland and Rhode Island, um, and, you know, kind of giving us a sense of what's going on in court systems in other states, um, and including some states that are, that you might think are like ours, like South Carolina and Georgia. Um, so having the opportunity to network with, with uh, committees and task forces and commissions that are like ours. I mean, we're broader, right? So we're not just the court system. We're like taking on all the government, but, 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 but we are, you know, courts are a part of what we're doing. Um, and, and I think the main, so it is, it is hosted, if you will, that they don't have a budget or staffing, the national consortium, but it's hosted by the national center for state courts. And I think the main thing is that they uh, sponsor a conference every year. And the 2024 conference is coming up in May. Uh, we, we don't have to be a task force member to attend, but I, I would just, um, I, I, I will like to be able to circulate um, the information and maybe we can like decide, um, get, have you all have a chance to look at it and then maybe at our next, next full task force meeting, we can, we can make a decision about whether to join and, but in the meantime, if anyone's excited about the national conference, um, there's an opportunity to attend. Um, and I will also um, let you all know that uh, Brandy has kindly agreed to copy all the really helpful material that we've been getting in the chat, um, including the links. Um, and so if, like me, you haven't been able to uh, capture that and preserve it, we'll, we'll circulate it to everyone um, after this meeting. But that was the only, New business I have, but does anyone else have anything they want to raise? Oh, and and I'll take any questions about the the national consortium. I'm not, okay, not seeing any hands. Um, so if if no one else has anything to bring um, to the good of the group and. We don't have any public comment today. Um, uh, Secretary Buffalo, I think that that's, I think we've made our way through our agenda. Uh, yes, ma'am, we have. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll yield one more opportunity uh, for anyone that has anything they wanna say before we wrap up this morning. Oh, okay. Thanks to our special guest, um, the Attorney General, for being with us today. Yes, General Stein. Good morning. Emily, I think I saw your hand raised. I didn't want to keep anyone now that we've been told we're, we're dismissing, but I just did want to say I've attended the National Consortium um, annual gatherings and they're excellent and i do think that people draw strength from learning about what people are doing in other states um and so you know i think salt lake city is where it is this year it's a bit far to go in in may but uh the one that i attended was in in williamsburg and they rotate every year and um, I, I would certainly support a proposal for this task force to join the consortium. I think it's a tremendous resource and I think it's uh, a deeper connection between North Carolina and the consortium would be, um, would be really beneficial. So thank you for that um, suggestion, Justice Earls. And I, I look forward to taking that up at our next meeting. Great, thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Okay, uh, our next meeting will be April the 26th on a Friday at 10 a.m. Uh, it'll be our virtual quarterly meeting again and uh, look forward to seeing you then. And if I don't see you before then, be safe and have a great weekend. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Justice. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.